وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أب القاسم محمد The topic of our discussion tonight is feminism. Before I get into the discussion, it's important to note that this topic is very diverse and multifaceted. It is impossible to discuss it in all its aspects within one night. In fact, it is a course that can be taught at a university over a whole semester. One can look at it from the perspective of the rise of Western feminism. One can look at it from the influence of Western feminism on Islamic feminism. One can look at it from the Islamic perspective with the view of secular feminism. Some can look at it from the view of the revivalists or the conservatives who say and suggest that we need to go back to the traditional teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his divine family. And then you have those who call themselves the Islamic feminists who are in between the secular feminists and the conservative ones. Those who would like to keep their Islamic religious identity and not denounce religion, but rather look for ways of looking at the texts and interpreting the texts. And even then, Within that, you still have so many branches. You have those who claim that we need to review the interpretations of the Quran, the likes of Amina Wadud, for example. You have those who say we need to look at the interpretation of the Ahadith in a contemporary context. You have those who come from a Shi'i school of thought, a Shi'i background. For example, Dr. Amina Inlaws, when she wrote about Imam Ali alayhi salam and his view of women in Nahjul Balagha, and she discusses that. You have the Sunni background or the non-Shi'i background. And again, we go back to Amina Wadud. You have Haifa Jawad. And therefore, you can see how diverse and how branched this topic may be. This hopefully will make you appreciate that it is impossible to discuss this topic in one lecture. Unless you always want to stay here until Salatul Layl, which is good, mustahab, inshallah, but I don't think many of you will remain. And then, Hajji Nuri, it will be you and I, inshallah. Therefore, our discussion tonight has to be very specific. Hence, we are going to take a look at four points, inshallah. The first point is what are the standards that the Quran sets for the rankings of humanity. Are these rankings based on gender? Are these based on race? Are these based on some other factors? So we're going to take a look at that and that will be the first point. Second, we will need to define feminism because feminism in itself has many definitions. Third, Based on the definition of feminism, we need to take a look at, are there any possible gender differences? 
And fourth, we come then to the Islamic context with regards to the definition of feminism that we will be using and seeing if Islam supports such a definition or not. And we'll take a look at only very specific examples. Some of you might leave tonight and say, well, the Sheikh did not touch upon this ayah. He did not touch upon this hadith. As I mentioned, it is impossible to discuss everything within an hour long lecture. But we'll just touch the tip of the iceberg, inshallah. So the first point, on what basis does Islam rank humanity? Is it on the basis of race? And the answer is no. Allah says explicitly in the Quran, La farqa. There is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab, A'jami. Except with one thing. What is it? Taqwa. God worriness and God piety. Taqwa can be translated as piety. God consciousness or God worriness. That is the first mode and way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ranks humanity. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ O people, we created you from a male and a female. And we've made you into societies, شُعُوبًا and tribes. This may be a reference to the rural world, the rural life, where Allah talks about قَبَائِل and the urban life, shu'ub, societies. So we've divided you, or we made you into these different societies, different cultures, different traditions. On what basis? Lita'arafu. So that you can get to meet one another, recognize one another. And alhamdulillah, in this part of the world, you get a taste of different cultures in one city. But then Allah says, Inna akramakum Allah atqakum, The most honored of you. Before God is the one with the greater God worriness or God consciousness or piety. That's one. Second way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala evaluates people and ranks them is on the basis of knowledge, ilm. Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Do those who know equal those who don't know? There is a difference. Those who have knowledge versus who don't, those who do not have knowledge. But what kind of knowledge? Any knowledge, some of the mufassireen, they suggest that those who definitely have knowledge, have ilm, they cannot be treated equally to those who don't have ilm, regardless of what that ilm is, what that knowledge is. Educated people definitely make more contributions to the society than those who may not be educated. That's what some people suggest. However, others say not necessarily. As we mentioned last night, you have many educated people Yet they use their education in the destruction of humanity. Like I mentioned last night, those who create all these weapons of mass destruction, who makes them? Educated people. And therefore, what they refer to as ilm, as knowledge, is the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The knowledge of Allah, recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For you may have someone who is uneducated, yet he is a humble, submissive servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have someone, you might have someone who is highly educated, yet he or she may not even recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتٍ Allah elevates, raises the ranks, darajat, it means the ranks in Jannah, raises those who have believed amongst you. So belief is important. But those who believe and have knowledge, in other words, they fear Allah, they have God consciousness. وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ So those who are believers, are God conscious and they have knowledge, yes, Allah will raise them into higher ranks in Jannah. <inaudible> Indeed, it is the ulama, the scholars, who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most, the greatest. So that is the second basis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala differentiating upon humanities. The first one is taqwa, God consciousness. The second one is ilm. The third one is amal, actions. Actions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Huwa alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala. He is the one who created you. The one who created death and life to test you, to examine you. Which one of you has the best deeds, the best actions? Of course, these actions are virtuous actions. Blessed actions. And then we come to the ayah that we recited at the beginning of the majlis from Surat Al-Nahl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Man amila salihan, anyone who performs virtuous deeds, min dhakarin aw untha, be it male or female, wa huwa mu'minun, and he is a believer, or she is a believer, falanuhyiyannahu hayatan tayyibah, we will make them live a blessed life. A good life. A life with good quality. And we will reward them with the best of what they used to do. They're believers. They're good doers. They perform actions. Allah says we'll reward them with the best. This is out of Allah's rahmah. This ayah shows us how merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much Allah wants us to go to Jannah. He says he will reward us with the best of our deeds. How many times have we prayed? A person reaches the age of 50, 60 years. How many times he has prayed or she has prayed? How many times have we fasted the month of Ramadan? Some people go several times to Hajj in their lifetime. Allah, out of his rahmah, out of his mercy, will choose the best salat that you performed in the 50 years of your life or 60 years of your life. That one day when you had some khushu' in your salat, he will choose that salat. And he will make all the other salat equal to this one. Out of his rahmah. With the best of what they used to perform. You fasted for 50 years. Which day did you fast with sincerity to Allah? You did not backbite anyone. You did not disobey Allah. You spent the day reading the Quran, helping the people. Allah will choose that day and will make everything equal to this day. Out of his rahmah. You see how merciful Allah is. That's why I don't want to get away from the topic, but I'll mention this very briefly. Imam al-Sajjad was told, there was a scholar at his time by the name of Al-Hasan al-Basri. They told him, Yabna Rasulillah, Al-Hasan al-Basri says, Ma ajibtu liman halak, kayfa halak? Walakin ajibtu liman najah, kayfa najah? 
He says, I am not surprised at those who do not make it to heaven. They end up in the hellfire. I'm not surprised how they end up in the hellfire. I am rather surprised at those who manage to make it to Jannah. Because of all the desires, all the temptations of this world, etc., etc. Imam al-Sajjad says, Hada ma yaquluhu al-Hasan al-Basri. He says, that's what he says. Amma ma aquluhu ana. However, what I say, and we know whatever Imam al-Sajjad says, is the saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, however, what I say, ma ajibtu liman naja kayfa naja. Walakin ajibtu liman halak kayfa halak. He says, I am not surprised at the one who makes it to Jannah, how he made it to Jannah. I am rather surprised at the one who ends up in the hellfire. How did he end up in the hellfire? Why? What does Allah say? وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَاتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy has encompassed everything. اللهم إني أسألك برحمتك التي وسعت كل شيء. Allah out of his rahmah really wants people to go to Jannah. He created us to go to Jannah, not to punish us. But a person, he or she himself chooses to go to Jahannam. He chooses or she chooses. Going back to the point, we see that there are three things. Taqwa, God consciousness, ilm, knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believing in Allah, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, greater submission to Allah. That's what the greater knowledge would lead to. And the third is what? Forgot already, mashallah? Al-amal. Good, mashallah. The ladies are really paying attention tonight. I have to really watch myself tonight. Amal. Your deeds, your actions, your virtuous deeds. In all those three things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say men only. It's general. Akramakum and Allah atqakum. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ وَقُلْ يَعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ Perform the deeds, Allah will see your deeds, etc., etc. None of these three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts any preference to male or female. And in the ayah in Surah Al-Nahl that I recited, Allah clearly says anyone who performs virtuous deeds, be it male or a female, Allah explicitly says, and he or she is a believer, then these people will have a blessed life. All right, so now this tells us that these are the three criteria on the rankings. And they are neutral, men and women. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second, with this in mind then, we see that Islam is not against the rights of women. But before we get there, what is the definition of feminism? Here, there are many definitions of feminism. The one we are going to take is the one by the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is written by Dr. Eleanor Burkett, who is a professor of journalism at the University of Alaska, and she has written on the field of women. The definition is simple. She says, or she writes in the Encyclopedia Britannica, feminism, the belief in social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. So feminism is the belief in social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. And hence, this is the definition that we shall take tonight. Based on this definition, are there any differences then between men and women? In here, some say yes, some say no. When we come to the moral psychology and the developmental psychology of people, there is a very prominent name that comes up. A man by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg. He was a professor of psychology at Harvard. 
he developed, he was a student of another psychologist by the name of Piaget, a Swiss psychologist. And Piaget is considered to be one of the first people to look at the moral development of children, that children develop in stages, they go through phases. And of course, this is in the academic world. So Piaget is one of the first who, who wrote about this whole thing. He was a contemporary to another psychologist by the name of Vygotsky, who also wrote about children development. Kohlberg was a student of Piaget. Kohlberg became a professor at Harvard. He developed what he called the six stages of moral development that the child or the people, people go through six stages of development. The last two stages of the moral development, he says, the second to last stage is the stage where people do what's right because it's the law. Yani if the law says it's legal to do this, people do it. If the law says it's illegal to do this, they will not do it. He says most people will achieve that level. Most people get to that level. However, he says there is another, a higher stage, a higher rank. And not every person achieves that level. What is it? He says doing what's right because it is right even if it challenges the laws. Doing what's right because it's right. The examples people can give, for example, they give Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. led the civil rights movement in the United States, even though it was against the law, but he challenged the laws. He said, we have to do what's right because it's right. We need to ask for our rights. Another example people cite is Gandhi in India. Although it was against the laws for him to protest, to ask for peaceful demonstrations, yet he challenged the laws. He said, we need to do what's right because it's right. It's our right to ask for our rights. And therefore challenge the laws. You have to change these laws. According to Kohlberg, not every person achieves that six stage interestingly however according to Kohlberg he suggests that women do not make it to that sixth stage quite interesting one of Kohlberg's students who graduated with him by the name of Carol Gilligan Carol Gilligan she became a professor later on in New York. She went back to her professor's findings. She noticed something. All the test subjects of Kohlberg were males or females? Males. Kohlberg only studied males. So she said, you know, there's a flaw in the conclusion. According to Carol Gilligan, Kohlberg has studied males. And he says, or he suggests, that the pinnacle of moral development for the male is to do what's right because it's right, even if it challenges the laws. That's what he suggests. How do we know this is the same pinnacle of moral development for women? What if they have a different pinnacle of moral development? So that's what she went out to study. That's what she did her research on. And she published a book in 1982 called In a Different Voice. And that's where she made a very interesting discovery. According to Carol Gilligan, who claims to be a feminist. However, she says, this is what she points in her words, feminism is one of the great liberation movements in human history. It is the movement to free democracy from patriarchy. In that sense, it's a movement to free everyone from the gender binary and the hierarchy of patriarchy in the interest of women and men. And 
in the interest of love. It is a way of dealing with human conflicts other than though the use of force and the imposition of hierarchy. It seemed to me then to say, if you think, and listen what he says, if you think you can explain the perpetuation of systemic patterns of injustice that is the repetition of a history of violence without a psychological or dynamic understanding, then she comes to the conclusion, psychology is integral to a feminism that is defined in those terms. So she says psychology is very important. When you talk about feminism, you cannot isolate psychology from it. What does she find? What does Carol Gilligan find? She finds that the pinnacle moral development for women is something she calls the ethic of care. That women care about others. For a woman, she says, their morality was based around care for others rather than appeals to seemingly universal codes of behavior. So this is what Carol Gilligan suggests. I repeat what she says. The morality of women was based around care for others rather than appeals to seemingly universal codes of behavior. Yani the conclusion of Kohlberg that women cannot achieve that pinnacle of moral development is incorrect because the pinnacle of moral development is ethical care to look for others to care for others interestingly in 2014 there is a university by the name of Vanderbilt in the United States they did a study this is a very interesting study they went to back in the 70s back in the 70s they went to gifted students these students were like the one percent top of their class gifted they had over a thousand boys and about 600 give or take girls they studied those individuals and then they went back to them four decades later so 40 years later when they studied them they were 13 year olds so four decades later how old are they don't scare me guys you don't know math? Uh, come on, I'm serious here. Four decades later, they were 13, you know. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Thank you, ladies. They were in their 50s now. So here is what they want. This is what they wanted to study. What did these people do? These were gifted people, very intellectual, very intelligent. They were the top. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahum salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Ajam. Li salamati samahati ayatillah a Sayyid al Mudagasi wa samahat al Sheikh wa Shiyukh al Afadil. Irfa'u aswatakum bis salati ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Allahum salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. لقضاء حوائجكم ولتنالوا شفاعة السيدة أم البنين ارفعوا أصواتكم ثالثة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد شغفت سيدنا مولاي العفو رجل المعذرة هذا جسارة من عندنا الله يسلمكم شيخنا الكريم حياكم الله الله يسلمكم إن شاء الله what they found after four decades, these were the top. Here is what they found. They found the, the following. The men are more likely to work in technology and, and engineering and to be CEOs. The women, however, were more likely to work in general business, education, and healthcare. When it comes to finance, medicine, and law, they were about equal. The men are far more intensely engaged in high-powered careers. They're engaged in high-powered careers. They work long hours and make lots of money. And listen to this. 
only two-thirds of women work full-time. These gifted women, gifted men, two-thirds of them only work full-time. However, listen to this. And sisters, you're going to like this one. The women who are married have high-earning husbands who make more than they do. And the married men have wives who make much less. Both agree that family is the most important thing in their lives. Okay. Then they go on to say, these differences do not stem from workplace discrimination. It's not because of the discrimination in the workplace. Both of them have that choice. But this is the choices they made. They're rooted in different preferences, values, and temperaments. The biggest gender differences concern the role of work and achievement versus family and community. The men want to make money, excel at work, and make an impact. The women care more about free time and flexibility than money. At the end, they say, what do these findings mean? Maybe that the women have been brainwashed but the authors suggest it's that there are multiple ways to construct a meaningful productive and satisfying life the authors suggest there are more ways multiple ways to construct a meaningful productive and satisfying life they do not quote carol gilligan in here in the study what's interesting is Carol Gilligan says that the highest pinnacle of moral development for women is to give up for others, to look after others, to care for others. What this study showed that 40 years later, these gifted boys and girls, the boys became very successful CEOs, technology, but the girls were more inclined to work in education, in healthcare, etc. And two-thirds of them only had full-time jobs. So that tells us there may be a difference here between the moral development of men and women. According to Carol Gilligan, the psychology of women differs from the psychology of men. They have different psychologies. Different physiologies, that's given, that's taken. But different psychologies, that was something that was new that she introduced. So based on that, we then come to the third point. So what does Islam say? Does Islam give women social empowerment, political empowerment, financial empowerment? Let's take a look at the history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi A lady came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. She said, Ya Rasulullah, we bear the children of the men, of our husbands. We take care of raising them. We look after them. When our husbands go for the fight, the battlefield, we take care of the, the children. Yet it is our husbands who fight in the way of Allah. Do jihad fi sabilillah. They get killed, they get martyred, and they get these higher ranks. How is that fair? So the women of Medina have requested me to come and speak to you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi looked at them and he said at his companions, he said, have you seen a woman so outspoken like her? They said, no, Ya Rasulullah, she's very outspoken. The Prophet ﷺ looked at her and said, go back to the women and tell them, Rasulullah ﷺ says that the work you are doing is not any less than what the men are doing in the battlefields. And your reward is not any less than what the men are gaining in the battlefields. Islam recognizes there are some differences, physiological differences maybe psychological differences and therefore islam gives different legislation for example with regards to jihad 
fighting in the battlefield that is not imposed and mandatory upon women but it is imposed upon men just because men are the ones who go and fight in the battlefield that does not make them any better than the woman that's the reality and here is the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa looking at this affirming this with regards to the political matter allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to mu'minat in surah al-mumtahina ya ayyuha nabi idha ja'aka al-mu'minatu yubayi'naka ala an la yushrikna billahi shay'a when the female believers come to pledge their allegiance to you that's a political matter they're pledging the allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And there are some conditions that the Quran lists. Tell them that they should look after Allah, fear Allah, and so on and so forth. There are some conditions, six conditions listed in the ayah. The last ayah of Surah Al-Mumtahana. On the day of Ghadir, when, Allah, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi introduced Amir al muminin or announced that Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi is his official successor, Man kuntu mawlah, fahada aliyun mawlah. The Muslims came and pledged their allegiance to Amir al Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi. Then the women had to come. How did they pledge their allegiance? Just like they pledged their allegiance to Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. How did the women pledge their allegiance to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? The Prophet brought a big bucket of water, filled it with water. He put his hand on one end. The women came and put their hand on the other end of the bucket. And that was their pledge of allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And that's how they pledged their allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi So they are practicing, they are participating in the political process. Here is a question just as a side note, very side note. Does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi need the bay'ah from the Muslims? Allah made him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He, Allah made him the Prophet of Allah. So why would Allah, why would Rasulullah get the bay'ah, bay'at al-Ridwan, bay'at al-Aqaba, those bay'ahs, those allegiance? Why would Rasulullah take them? It is li ilqa al so that the people don't have a choice, don't have a way of refusing or refuting. So the Prophet is dealing with the situation from the humanly perspective. Similarly, with the bay'ah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, when Imam Ali became the Khalifa of the Muslims. He is Khalifatullah fi ardh. Does Imam Ali need the Muslims to pledge allegiance to him? No, he doesn't. But Ilqa al Hujj to demonstrate that people chose him. And therefore, Imam Ali used use this logic, this kind of logic to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Because that's the logic Muawiyah understands. When he wrote a letter to him and he said, When the Ansar and the Muhajireen pledge their allegiance to someone, then you have to be binding by that allegiance, whether you were present or non present. That was the logic Muawiyah understands. Otherwise, to tell him, I am Khalifatullah, I am Hujjatullahi fi Arda, Muawiyah doesn't understand that logic. He doesn't accept that logic. So, to use that logic so that people can understand. And hence, when Az Zubair and Talha wanted to negate the Pledge of Allegiance, he reminded them, you pledge your allegiance to me. And therefore they became a nakithin, those who revoked their allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib salam alayhi alayhi. On that context, the women participated in the political process. Even today, in some Muslim countries, in some Muslim countries, there are more female representatives in the parliament than in the United States Senate. So until this day and age, Islam does not stop women from participating in the political process. Islam from the women from voting. Their economic values, their social values. A woman comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, my husband has rejected me. Al-Mujadila, Surat Al-Mujadila. He did dhihar. He basically said, you are haram to me, like my mother is haram to me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered the man to come. And he immediately dealt with the situation. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with the matter. The ayat of the Quran, Al-Muslimin wal-Muslimat, wal-Mu'mineen wal-Mu'minat, to the end of the ayah, 
Allah addresses male and female believers. Therefore, from the Quranic context, from the history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam, they guaranteed the rights of women. And they accepted their testimony. A lady by the name of Suda bint Imara al Hamdaniya. She was from the city of Hamdan in Yemen. When Muawiyah became the Khalifa, the people of Hamdan were very close allies to Imam Ali alayhi salam, very close supporters. They supported him, especially in Safin. They were next to him. When Muawiyah came, he poured his wrath against them. He seized all their land. Muawiyah poured his wrath against anyone who supported Imam Ali alayhi salam. In Medina, for example, he tripled the taxes. So you can buy rice in Medina, the cost of rice, well, although there wasn't rice, but qamh, wheat and barley. Al qamh in Medina was triple the price than the qamh in Sham. Triple the price. He tried to impoverish them. So he fought against anyone because the people of Medina al Ansar, most of them were with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Most of them. So he poured his wrath against all those who supported Kufa. He poured his wrath on them. He put Ziyad ibn Abi as their governor. Medina, he poured his wrath on them. He increased their taxes, impoverished them. Hamdan, Yemen, he seized their lands. So he poured his wrath, his anger against them. Why did they support Ali ibn Abi Talib? He seized the lands from the people of Hamdan. So Suda, this lady, a lady, gets up travels all the way from Yemen to Sham, comes to see Muawiyah. She enters. Muawiyah looks at her, says, Suda, what brings you here? Weren't you the one standing next to Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Safin, reciting verses of poetry to encourage his army to fight against me and my army? She says, yes. And if time were to go back, I would do exactly the same thing I did. But unfortunately, Ali Salamullah Ali is gone. Times have changed and puts you in power, Ya Muawiyah. She says, what brings you here? He said, what brings you here? She says, you have seized my land and the land of the people of Hamdan. I am here to reclaim that land. Give us back the land. He says, what? You have come to ask me to give you the land back, get back, get out. And if you don't leave right now, I am going to force that they put you on a camel with no respect and no dignity and be taken all the way back to Hamdan in a disgraceful manner. Suda at that point cried and she recited a couple of verses of poetry. Salla ilahu ala jasadin. She praised Amir al Mu'mineen. She recited two verses of poetry where she said that with the death of this great man, justice was also buried. When he was buried, justice was buried with him. She was among the first to say that justice was buried with Ali ibn Abi Talib. She was among the first. Muawiyah, when he heard her, he said, Suda, who are you referring to? Is it Ali ibn Abi Talib? She said, who else? Who other than Ali ibn Abi Talib? She said, I came to Ali ibn Abi Talib one day. From Yemen, I came to Kufa. I arrived at Masjid al-Kufa. Ali was about to start Salat al-Jama'ah. Salamullahi alayhi. Imam Ali was about to begin Salat al-Jama'ah. When I called him, I said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. He left. He stopped. He didn't start the salat. He came. He attended to me. He said, What would you like? What do you want? What's the problem? She said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, the governor you have imposed on us, you put us in, on us in Yemen, he is not treating us fairly. She said, When I told him this, Imam Ali cried. And he turned to Allah and said, Ya Rab. Do not hold me responsible for what he is doing. I ordered them to treat people with respect, with fairness, with justice. This is not what I told them to do. 
He's asking Allah for forgiveness. Then he took a piece of what we call today paper. He had a piece of leather in his pocket. He took it out and he wrote a letter on it. Like a piece of paper and a pen. He wrote a letter on it. Where he said, the minute that you receive this message of mine, you are dismissed from your post. And, and someone else is going to come and take over from you. He closed the letter, he gave it to me, and he said, Suda, go back and take this letter to him. He says, that's how Ali ibn Abi Talib dealt with the situation. And look at the difference between you and him. I come to you and I tell you, your governor in Yemen is stealing our lands. And you're telling me this is how I'm going to treat you and send you back disgracefully? Look at the difference between you and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi, listen to me. He gave me dignity, respect. And then Imam Ali went back to the salat. You see? Imam Ali alayhi salam, did not tell her, you're a woman. What brings you here? Go back. Not at all. With utmost dignity, with utmost respect, listens to her complain, answers, deals with the situation, and then sends her back. When Muawiyah heard this, he says, okay, Suda, okay. I'm going to give you your land back. I'll give you your land. He says to his writer, he says, write, please make a note that Suda bint Imar al Hamdaniya gets her land back. She looks at him and she says, Muawiyah, I didn't come here just to claim my land. I am here to claim everyone's land. Tell your writer to write, all the lands are back. He looked at her with anger. قال لقد أظمكم ابن أبي طالب الجرأة. He says Ali ibn Abi Talib made you guys in such manner that you can talk because he was so fair, he was so just. He would not punish you, he would not harm you. So you guys became outspoken. She said Muawiyah, right. He turns to his writer, he says, okay, خلاص. Give her all the land. She takes that land, she takes that paper, and she gets out. That's Suda bit Imar al Hamdan. That's one example. This is how Ahlul Bayt this is how the Prophet Amirul Mu'mineen dealt with women. In the political process, in the financial process, looking after the welfare of the women. They came to Imam Ali alayhi salam. They said, There is a lady who is working, she takes care of preparing the brides when they get married, the brides, she's the one who, it's like today what we call the salon, the hair salon, back in those days, she was the one, he says, La he says, no problem, what's wrong with that? That's fine, she can do that. So when we talk about equal opportunities, when we talk about in social matters, in political matters, in economic matters, Islam is full of such examples. So here then we come to two important points. If that were the case, then how about the issue of hijab? Because some feminists, especially the secular feminists, the secular feminists argue against this point. They say hijab limits the woman. Hijab does not allow women to be liberated, to be free. In here, there is an issue that I touched upon a couple years ago in Muharram, so I will not invest a lot of time on it. I will touch upon it very briefly. But the question is about freedom, brothers and sisters. Do we have unlimited freedom? Is there such thing as absolute freedom? Are you free to drive on the road any way you want? Or are there laws to limit how you drive? Especially here in London, mashallah, with all the cameras, mashallah. The other day someone tells me, even in the parking, they have cameras. They're waiting for you not to pay. So mashallah, the minute you don't pay, you'll receive a gift card in the mail. When people know this, they will adhere to the law. Subhanallah. Again, a side note, I don't want to go into this field or talk about this. 
people are worried about the cameras of the police but they're not worried about the radar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the cameras of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is watching us Allah is looking after us yet we don't care we do whatever we want and that's why Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam says Ana alladhi asaytu jabbar as sama I am the one who disobeyed the great one of the skies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nonetheless can you drive any way you want no you can't can you get up on the plane as it is in the middle of the air and you stand by the emergency exit door and you say Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar huh what will happen someone comes to you what are you doing freedom of speech I'm practicing my freedom of speech they say okay when we descend inshallah there you will find out your freedom of speech in the prison Go. therefore there is no such thing as absolute freedom and that's why I quoted back then a paper which I will remind you again of it a paper that was published back in 1998 by a professor of political science at the University of Oklahoma his name is Dr. Hertzk H-E-R-T-Z-K-E -E. Dr. Hertzk has a paper called the theory of moral ecology in that paper he says that notion of freedom has led to the problems some of the problems we see in the society today because it's a false notion to be free to do whatever you want there is no such thing as absolute freedom but it's something that's used in different ways when it comes to disassociating yourself from religion not implementing religious values people say freedom we are free to do whatever we want and people are promoting this but when it comes to driving when it comes to speaking in certain areas certain certain things there no 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 here we have to limit what you say and what you do well that's double standards in a book that was published back in 2004 by a professor by the name of Patrice Oplinger from Boston University this is what she says I will not read the title of the book but you can look at her name Patrice Oplinger O-P-P-L-I-G-E-R she says in the book and instead of advancing women's power popular culture tends trends in the United States appear to be backsliding backsliding into sexual exploitation of women advancing women power this is not advancing women's power what she's saying what she's saying is popular culture trends in the United States is backsliding it's backsliding there is exploitation is the word she uses when it comes to hijab of course there is a physical form of the hijab and then there is a social form of the hijab and this applies to men and women how do you deal with each other how do you interact with one another with modesty with respect and the same rules apply online people these days when they go online they feel that no the guard is down I can say whatever I want I can write whatever I want I can do whatever I want and that is not true these guidelines exist and parents really need to pay attention to the technologies to what's going on today it's really a difficult world today to keep up with all the apps and the technologies and what's coming up we give our children these tools but we don't look after what's going inside them there is an app which I will not mention its name but that app looks like a calculator on the outside it's very innocent it's a calculator so if you come to your daughter or to your son say can I see your gadget he said, Fadal. there you go you look at it oh mashallah everything looks halal here Fadal, yalla, no problem it's a calculator but once you enter a specific code on that calculator the app changes and opens a whole world of pictures there 
is where some of the teenagers and the youth are hiding stuff. Why would they keep their pictures there? Well, I'll leave the answer to you. Why aren't there pictures in the photos? Well, we'll leave that up to you. But that's what we need to look up and look after. What are our children doing online? Nonetheless, and this is causing a lot of problems. Men are talking to women, non mahram. They don't really care about the guards. The same guards rules apply, whether you're talking physically or you're talking online. With respect, with dignity, with modesty. Therefore, these things are extremely important. That's the modest part. That's the social part. Then we have the physical form of the hijab, which for women is to cover the whole body, head to toe, with the exception of the face and the hands up to the wrist. And to make sure that a woman does not wear anything tight to reveal her figure. In addition, the majority of the fuqaha, they also add that no makeup visible. Makeup can be shown. The men too. One day I was attending a salat. And my salat was qasr. So after I prayed, I moved back to the line. When I moved back, there were some youth praying in front of me in the line. Every time we go to ruku, I have to close my eyes. If you know what I mean. And I'm thinking to myself, why are you wearing this to the Husayniya or to the masjid? Fashion. So that's the social form of the hijab. And there is also the physical form of the hijab. Now, what does the Quran say? In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah says, adna an yu'rafna fala yu'dayn. When they wear these losing clothes, clothings, it's best that such that they are recognized as mu'minat and they are not harmed. Here is something interesting. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Because the feminists argue. They say, why should I dress the way so that I will not be harmed by the men? The men have their own problems. They need to turn their faces away. خلص. I should not. That's the whole essence of feminism. To do what I want to do. Wear what I want to wear. Not to be dictated by other person. I have news for you. This harm may not necessarily be coming from men. It may be coming from women. How so, Sheikh? In a study that was published in 2008 by a professor by the name of Shelley Grabe, G-R-A-B as in boy, E. Shelley Grabe. She wrote that 50% of girls and undergraduate women in the United States suffer from physical and psychological disorders because of the perceived or portrayed image of perfection by the media. In the media, when they look at women, how they're portrayed, female models, continuous exposure to this message that this is the perfect look, the perfect ideal, then when girls, 50% of girls and undergraduate women in the United States are suffering because they look at that image and they look at themselves and say, I am not pretty enough. In the United States, there are 100, 330 million people. So when we talk about 50% of female, how many of girls and undergrad, how many are we talking about here? Let's say 330, let's say 300 to make the math easy. Divide them by half, you know, 50-50, male, female. Okay. Out of the 150 million, how many of them are girls and undergraduate women? What, 50%, 10%, 20%? Here we're talking about 30 million, 40 million. Do you know something? That's the population of Canada. So almost the whole population of Canada is suffering from mental and physical disorders because of that portrayal of the perfect image, not by men, but by women. Zeminski, another professor, he wrote another paper called The Objectification of Women. He says continuous, or she says, continuous exposure to these beautiful looks make women 
want to objectify themselves, treat themselves as objects. And here we have problem with the boys as well. Because the boys are also looking at these beautiful women. When it comes time for marriage, if they look at a muhajjaba, they say, no, I don't want her. I don't. This is, she's not pretty. I would like someone who puts makeup on, someone who wears the tights. That's what I would like. And unfortunately, what happens is sometimes a lady would say, I would like to get married, but nobody wants to come and marry me. I am muhajjaba, mu'mina, I wear my abaya. That's the fault of the boys, the men. We need to really address this issue as well. Therefore, when it comes to hijab, it introduces this modesty, the safeguard for women, the protection of women, not necessarily from, from men. As the feminists might argue, we say women from women. So that's something important. The second point, and we'll finish with this, inshallah, that will be the last issue we discuss, and that's marriage. Marriage is extremely important in Islam. Some feminists would argue. They say, no, I want to be liberal. I want to do whatever I want. We read the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. A lady comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, and she says, Yabna Rasulillah, I do not want to get married. He asks her, why not? She says, I am a person who is a devout worshiper. I don't want the husband to tell me you can fast today, you cannot fast the other day, you know, I want this, I want that. I want to be free to worship Allah the way I like. He looked at her and he said, who is better, you or my mother Fatima alayhi salam? She looked at him and she said, obviously, Sayyidah Zahra salam Allah is much better than I am. He said then, she got married to Ali ibn Abi Talib salam Allah alayhi. You think her marriage to Amir al muminin decreased her ibadah? Stopped her from worshipping Allah? Decreased her status before Allah? So that doesn't make any sense. But what's important, my brothers and sisters, is that the men and the women need to discuss if they are going to get married, if there are important things for the man or for the woman, you need to discuss them before the marriage. Don't say, I'll wait until the marriage happens and then we'll talk. No. For example, if the husband to him, if it is very important that the woman, for example, if they have children, he wants the wife to stay at home and raise them. For example, he needs to address that issue. If the woman decides, no, I want to work. I got a degree and therefore I want to work after marriage. Then discuss that issue. Discuss it. And come to the agreement, come to the consensus. How do you want to move on in your future and move on in your lives? It's important. You can have conditions in the marriage contract. Even when it comes to the qawamiyya, qawamuna ala nisa. This qawamiyya, according to some mufassireen, interestingly, Amina Wadud says, al qawamiyya here is the right of the divorce. It's in the hand of men. What's interesting about Amina Wadud, when she writes, she writes from a non-Shi'i perspective. When I read about her writings and what she's doing, a lot of her interpretation comes from the Shia or similar to the Shia. She quotes non-Shi'a Mufassirin and she says there is a problem with these non-Shi'a Mufassirin. We say, well, look at what the Shi'a Mufassirin say. Because the tafsir is not up to a person. It's up to what Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ Based on the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim Even the mufassirin of Ahlul Bayt, they read, they look, the Shia mufassirin, the scholars, they see what did Rasulullah say, what did Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam say. And that's how they discuss and interpret the Quran, not based on whatever they think. Not about this. Qawamiyya is divorce, correct. The divorce is in the hand of the man. However, in many countries in the Muslim world, Iran included, you can have a condition in the marriage contract. You can have a condition that if the husband, for example, if he abuses me emotionally, physically, if God forbid he becomes, you know, alcoholic, if he starts gambling, if he starts taking drugs, then I have the right. He gives me the power of attorney and the authority to divorce myself. If he accepts this condition, then it materialized in the marriage contract. 
So the marriage life is really important, but it's a partnership, brothers and sisters. Marriage is not about you have to do this and I have to do this, my way or the highway. It doesn't work that way. Allah says about marriage, mawadda wa rahma, love and mercy. Mercy, there is mercy. If I see the wife tired, khalas, I go help her with the chores in the house. That's what Imam Ali used to do. Salamullahi alayhi. Help Sayyida Zahra in the chores of the house. Not the concept, the concept where I am the man of the house. Khalas. Any man who helps his wife in the chores of the house achieves the ranks of the Siddiqeen. At the same time, the wife helps the husband. If she sees him tired, he's working hard. If there is love amongst them, if there is agreement, mercy between them, she helps them husband, the husband helps her. That's really the example we see in the life of Amirul Mu'mineen, Salamullahi alayhi. And the Sayyid al-Zahra and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Therefore, does Islam support feminism? If we define feminism as treating women with dignity, treating women with respect, but keeping in mind that she and the man are different physiologically, maybe different psychologically, and therefore the ahkam, the rulings are different. Then Islam is talking about gender equity, not gender equality. And that's what we have to understand. Equality is an equation. Two plus two equals four. Two sides are equal. Men are not equal to women. Physically they're different. Psychologically possibly they may be different and so on and so forth. But there is gender equity. The Prophet one day go, comes to the house of a Sayyid al-Zahra alayhi salam He finds Imam Ali is working with her on the hand mill. So he asks, which one of you two is more tired? Imam Ali answers. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I, I am stronger than a Fatima alayhi salam She's more tired than me. She's, she's tired. So the Prophet says, Ya Fatima, step aside. He sits down and he starts doing the hand mill working in the house of Sayyid al-Zahra alayhi salam This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt. And in the Shi'i school of thought, brothers and sisters, we have great examples and role models like Sayyid Khadija, Sayyid al-Zahra, Sayyid Zainab al-Kubra alayhi salam Sayyid Nafisa who was a teacher of a Shafi'i, Al Imam al Shafi'i, he used to study with a Sayyida Nafisa. He would go visit her. He would go visit her. A Sayyida Fatima al Ma'suma. In fact, I was teaching, I'm teaching at uh, one of the local universities in Canada. I taught a class. I told them, to the best of my knowledge, the only dynasty in the history that is named after a woman is the Fatima dynasty that is named after Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam the Shia give high reverence to the status of women and this is being practiced until this day and age what we need to understand culture is different from religion yes in some cultures women's rights are abused correct we don't deny that but don't mix this with religion and that's what Haifa Jawad, who is a feminist, she's written an article about feminism. That's what she asserts. Don't mix culture and religion. Culture, yes, you may have oppression of women, but the religion does not oppress women. Islam treats women with utmost dignity, utmost respect. And when the Quran gives examples to the males and the females, Allah gives examples of two women, not men. And later on, Allah uses the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya and Maryam as an example, as role models for men and women. These are real. We have fuqaha today who study the fiqh of as Sayyid al-Zahra alayhi salam. We see, derive knowledge, ilm, fiqh from her. So if a woman is more pious than a man, she has a higher rank in, than, than him in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If she has greater knowledge, she has higher rank. If she works more diligently in the way of Allah, she has a higher rank. 
This is the reality, brothers and sisters. That's reality. And this extends to this day and age, until this day and age. And hence, when the Islam religion comes to the lady Umm al-Baneen, salamullahi alayha. What a noble lady. What a virtuous lady. What a great lady. This lady who served Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam to the point where she became among awliya Allah al-Salihin. Babun of Abwabul Hawaij, one of the gates of Hajat. The followers of Ahlul Bayt give utmost reverence to a Sayyida Ummul Banin, to Fatima to Zahrai alayha salam. In fact, to the rights of women. This lady, when the family and the caravan of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam left, it went over to Karbala. Now she is waiting for them to return back. She's waiting. She lived with Amirul Mu'mineen such a loving life, such a great life. And Ahlul Bayt gave her utmost respect. She became one of them. As we read in the Masaib, when Zainab alayhi salam came back to her house and she said no one to enter and they heard the knock on the door, they said Ummul Banin is at the door, can we allow her? She says, of course, she is of us. She became of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. That's the reverence, that's respect. But she continued to wait, hearing back Maybe one day her sons will return. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam will return. She used to wait until she heard one day the cry coming. Ya ahla yathrib la muqam lakum biha قتل الحسين فأدمع مدرار الجسم منه بكربلاء مضرج والرأس منه على القناة يدار Bishr ibn Hadlam, this poet who Imam al-Sajjad met at the outskirts of Medina, he said, Bishr, do you know some poetry like your father did? He said, yes, Ya ibn Rasulillah. He said, then go into Medina and mourn the loss of my father, the martyrdom of my father, Abi Abdullah, as we want to enter Medina when it is in the state of Aza, grief, mourning. So Bishop says, I went to the city of Medina. I went by every house and I started calling them, O oh, people of Yathrib, which is the old name of Medina before the Prophet arrived. Leave your city, leave, which is an ayah from the Quran. He started with that. People came out saying, Bishr, what is the matter? He says, the news will be delivered at the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. When they arrived to the grave of Rasulullah, he says, not a single person remained in their house in the city. Everyone came. That's when I delivered the news. Oh, people of Medina, leave the city of Medina. As my tears are flowing from my eyes, Hussein has been killed in Karbala. His body is under the horses of Bani Umayyah and the head is on the spears of Bani Umayyah touring from one city to another city. 
He says, when the people of Medina hear this, everyone started crying, Aywa Imam, Aywa Hussein. He says, at that point, I saw an elderly lady carrying a child approaching me. I asked, who is she? They told me, oh, Bishr, be careful. This is Ummul Banin al Arba'a. This is the mother of Abayas and his siblings. She approached me. I asked, who is the child she's carrying? They told me this is Al Fadl, the son of Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas. She came to me and she said, Ya Bishra, I heard you have news about my son Abi Abdullah Al Hussein. He's my son. Tell me about him. She never asked me about her own children. Is my master, is my beloved Abi Abdullah back? Is he back? He says, I didn't know where to begin with this lady. How can I tell her the news? I thought a little bit. So I told her, Ya Umm al Banin, your youngest son was killed in the battle. She said, I didn't ask you about my youngest son. May he be sacrificed for Abi Abdullah. Tell me, did Abi Abdullah come back? I told her, Ya Umm al Banin, your second son was also killed in Karbala. I didn't ask you about my second son. Tell me about Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Ya Umm al Banin, your third son was also killed in Karbala. She said, Ya Bishr, tell me about Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Is he back? At that point, I told her, Ya Umm al Banin, Azam Allah, Lakil Ajr, Ya Shia al Hussein, Bimusab Abil Fadl al Abbas. Even Abbas was killed in Karbala. ولا جاء ولا جاء أربع أولاد لراحة ولا جاء أربع أولاد لراحة ولا جاء وأنا بعد أرض متلمني ولا جاء على الخبرة على الخبرة شكثر لا ولا ولا جاء ارفعوا راسي بجهاد الغاضر اي والله والنعم بيهم ارفعوا راسي بجهاد الغاضر اي اي at that point بشر says I saw her dropping the child onto the ground and she cried and said, Ya Bishr, لقد مزقتني آط قلبي You've cut my heart into pieces. May all my four children be sacrificed for my master, Abi Abdullah Al Hussein. Tell me, is Imam Al Hussein back? At that point, I told her, Ya Shia Al Hussein. عظم الله لكم الأجر بمصاب أبي عبد الله الحسين قتل شهيدا في كربلاء جسد تحت الخيول رأسه فوق النصور point I told her Ya Umm al -Banin, Abi Abdullah has been killed in Karbala that's when she dropped the child and cried Aywa Imam Aywa Hussein Ana laqa'id ala darb al-dhu 
وأناشد ليرحون ويجون كل من له غياب يلفون وأنا غايب باللحد مدفون آه زينب عليها السلام came back to مدينة she went to the قبر of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله السلام عليك يا جدا يا رسول الله جئتك ناعية ولدك الحسين قتل مظلوما في كربلاء رنج های زینب دید روز ببینم در تشت پر خون پر جگر از برادر امروز از آیم در کربلا و حسین She went back to the house. What an empty house it is. As she enters into the house, she looks on one side. This is where Ami Abdullah used to pray his salat. That's where Ali Al Akbar used to sit down and talk to me. This is where Abu Fadl Al Abbas used to take care of me. This is the room of Al Qasim ibn Al Hassan. And that is the cradle of Abdullah Al Shaheed. آه صاحت صوت يا دار الأحباب آه يلا شموحش يا دار الأطياب آه وبهالحياة لا نصيح ورا الباب أنا مع عباس جيتك لا تذكرين Oh, Zainab goes to the house. She's in mourning. They're in grief. She tells the women that close the doors. Don't allow anyone to enter as we are in the state of Aza, mourning of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. At that point, they hear a knock on the door. One of the maids goes quickly and then she runs back. She says, Sayyidati, Ummul Banin is at the door. Shall I allow her to enter? She says, Of course, she is of us. So she enters Salamullahi alayha The minute she sees Zainab She cries Aywa waladah Wa Hussein Zainab answers back Aywa akhah Wa Abbasaya Zainab Tell me what happened In Karbala I told Abbas to take care of you how is it I heard that you became a prisoner? She replied, Ya Umm al Baneen, do not blame Abu al Fadl al Abbas. Had he had his right hand, his left hand, had they not shot him with an arrow in his eye, Ya Umm al Baneen, I would have never became a prisoner to Bani Umayyah. جرت المدى آمع يوم شمر شمر عن ساعدي ومتنزي نبك السرى 
صرخيت ونادت والفؤاد تفطر يا انعم جوابا يا حسين اما ترى شمر الخنا بالصوت كسر اضلعي سيدنا الجليل مولاي تفضل دعاء لكم رجاء من خادمكم الصغير تفضل مولاي شيخنا الجليل مولاي تفضل شيخنا عزيزنا تفضل مولاي ارفعوا ايديكم بالدعاء please your hands in the dua this is the time when حاجات are accepted ان شاء الله brothers and sisters you are in the majlis of باب الحوائج ام البنين you are the guests of ام البنين سلام الله عليها and ان شاء الله she would not leave you leaving the house that is of her guests without fulfilling your hajat. Inshallah, the hajat will be accepted in these eyes that are full of our tears for this noble lady and for her children and for Abi Abdullah al Hussein. We raise our hands and our biggest dua is may Allah make us and our children until the day of judgment among the sincere Shia of Sayyidah Zahra alayha salam and the sincere servants of Imam al Hussein salamullahi alayhi. Everyone together, we have many mu'mineen who have requested us to remember them in our dua. Some are ill. Some are in difficulties, some are imprisoned unfairly and unjustly. They are all in need of our dua. And we all have hajat, everyone together. I don't want anyone to remain silent. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su. يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم ten times together يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار مع محمد وآله الأطهار يا الله اللهم بباب الحوائج أم البنين اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اللهم اقض حوائجهم شافي مرضاهم احفظهم في أنفسهم وفي أهليهم وفي أوطانهم بحفظك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة اللهم اجعلنا وذريتنا إلى يوم الدين من شيعة الإمام الحسين المتقين يا الله ومن خدمته المخلصين يا الله وارزقنا شفاعته في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب رب ارحمهما كما رباني صغيرا اجزهما بالاحسان احسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا ناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى
تسكنه كطوعا تمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين لقضاء الحوائج شفاء المرضى كشف هذه الغم عن هذه الامه ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان والى ارواح امواتنا واموات الجالسين والحاضرين والمساهمين والباذلين والمشاركين والى ارواح الشهداء والعلماء والمزيد من موفقية سماحة آية الله السيد هادي المدرسي وأهله وعائلته وأولاده وسماحة الشيوخ الكرام الأفاضل وللمزيد من طولة عمرهم إن شاء الله رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات